Yes, uh, thank you, Paul. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you for uh, participating to this uh, first webinar organized by the ERM uh, committee under the SIS, so thank you. Uh, before to start this session, uh, I would like to, uh, to, to do some, uh, some few reminders for a good conduct of this, uh, this session. Uh, first of all, uh, I will ask you to uh, make sure that you put your microphone off during this session to avoid any unexpected noises uh, uh, that can disturb the, the, the speakers. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, questions can be entered um, via, via the chat box within the, the Zoom platform. And I will relay the questions uh, to the speakers and they will answer you at the end of each uh, presentation. So please, can you send me the, the questions? Uh, I mean, can you send the, the, the questions to me and not to the, speaker, the, the speakers directly? So I, I, can, I will be able to, uh, to relay the, the questions. Um, regarding the CPD, uh, just a, a reminder, in order to apply uh, for CPD, I would like to remind uh, the uh, SIS uh, members that uh, it's not recorded automatically. So uh, to allow the SIS uh, secretariat to validate attendance, you need to change your display name to your registers full name to facilitate attendance uh, taking. So as you probably know, this session will be recorded. So if you want to, uh, to watch it again, uh, you, can, you can find it on the SAS website uh, after this, uh, this webinar. And the, the slides as well, you can find them, uh, you can find the, all the presentation in the SAS uh, website after this, uh, this se seminar. And so don't forget, if you have any questions uh, during the session, you can uh, send them on the, uh, on the chat box uh, of this, uh, this uh, the Zoom platform. So welcome to this uh, webinar entitled uh, AI uh, Modeling Ethics and Risk Governance in Insurance use Uses. Uh, this conference starts now at 4 p.m. and it will end at 6 p.m. So it will last two hours and each speaker will make a presentation uh, in order to introduce the artificial intelligence modeling in, uh, in insurance and how actuaries can use AI in their risk modeling. But not only uh, the ethic issue that, that uh, AI can bring on the table uh, will be a highlight as well. So we are very excited to present this webinar because this topic is, uh, is related to artificial intelligence. And uh, you, are, you have probably heard about this subject, whether it is at work or through application that we use, or simply because it is a subject that is very trendy and affect many sectors, such as insurance, banking, transport, trade, uh, industry in, in general, etc. So the AI scope is very large. And uh, today we have decided to present this, uh, this topic on uh, artificial intelligence modeling on the ethics and risk governance in insurance uh, uses. So to go through these uh, ideas, we have the honor to, uh, of bringing together three speakers and a specialist in the field of uh, artificial intelligence. And each of them are uh, specializing in specific area of AI. So Jian Shu Wang, uh, hello, JS. Uh, Jack, Xai. Hello, Jack. Uh, yeah. And, uh, and Jean-Michel Lubes. Hello, Jean-Michel. <laughs> Hello, Hida. Okay. So first of all, I will prob I will, we will start the, the webinar and I will uh, introduce the, the first uh, speaker. So JS, he's uh, currently working at AI Singapore called AISG and um, it's a uh, research and innovation program in AI for Singapore. Uh, JS has many years of AI uh, data science uh, research and consulting experience. And before joining uh, AISG, he was the head of insights and modeling of a leading global reinsurer, where he led his team to deliver a number of uh, significant data science projects for their key clients in the Asia region uh, in Asia uh, Pacific region. So uh, JS will introduce uh, what is AI modeling and give some examples of applications in the uh, insurance industry. 
he will give some highlights on how to encourage and promote the actuaries who use AI and to be more part of the AI and share about the data quality, which is a hot uh, topic in, in uh, artificial intelligence. So um, I will let you to, to start your presentation, uh, JS. I will stop sharing my screen so you can right. share your sure, screen. Yeah. Thank, thanks, Ria. Thank, thanks, Paul, and thanks, uh, SAS, for, for the invitation. It's re really my, uh, my honor to be, to be here. Uh, give me a second. Let me just share my screen. Uh, right. Can you see my screen? Yes. All right, cool. Okay, so uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Yeah, uh, again, uh, it's really my, my pleasure and my honor uh, to be here. All right, and then uh, we'll spend the next couple of minutes to, to talk about uh, what, what is AI and, and what is the uh, application of AI in, in, in insurance industry and some of the issues or some of the topics uh, I feel is quite relevant for, for insurance industry. Right? Okay, so before I start, I'll probably give a uh, a quick uh, introduction uh, of Riada, uh, of, uh, of uh, yeah, Singapore. I mean, Riada just not give a very brief introduction of it already, but uh, maybe I mean, a lot of you probably may not really like, like heard about this organization before, right? But uh, this, uh, our, our AI Singapore was, was, was funded by uh, Singapore government, uh, a national research foundation, and hosted by uh, National University uh, of Singapore. Right? So I think we, we are given the mandate uh, from the government to really grow the, uh, the local AI uh, ecosystem, right? including the, uh, grow the local talent and help the local uh, industry to really adopt uh, AI. So that's why we do a lot of uh, outreach and we also have a lot of uh, activities uh, together with the IHL, I mean, Institute of Higher Learning, and also uh, the local industry to really to, 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 to build the ecosystem together. So that's kind of the, the mandate of AI Singapore. And yeah, okay, now let's the yeah, first slide I have, right? So let's, let's start from a, a quick uh, overview of AI, right? I mean, of course, over here, I list like three uh, key key terms, right? I mean, a lot of us probably heard about it uh, quite often in, in the news, right? I mean, uh, AI, machine learning, and deep learning. So, I mean, in a lot of our minds, we feel these three are, in a way, are similar or, or equivalent, right? But I think there are slightly uh, a, a difference uh, here. So, AI, in fact, is a, is a kind of a field, it will probably start about, about uh, like, in the uh, 50s, in, in the la uh, last century, right? And then you, I mean, of course, for people that we just are old enough, they probably know, heard about it, there are two uh, AI winters, right? Because there was some 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 over uh, optimism uh, in in old days, right? And then uh, machine learning, in a way, is one of the way to achieve AI, right? It probably also be one of the most promising way to achieve AI, right? That's machine learning, and then deep learning, in a way, is again it's a subset of the machine learning techniques, right? I think recently, in the recent years, probably starting from uh, 20, 2010, Right, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of, uh, uh, we, we saw a lot of uh, uh, success stories, which are really driven by deep learning, right? Especially in uh, the text and uh, uh, the tasks related to text and the image data. Right? So this in a way, uh, is, they are different, but I think for us, maybe in, in, in this, the pur purpose of this talk, uh, we can treat them uh, the same, right? Uh, so now maybe we can look at the, uh, the technical aspect of AI or machine learning, right? So. Uh, let's take maybe a couple of minutes to just give us a kind of a, a crash course uh, in, in machine learning, right? So, so what is machine learning really about, right? I mean, it may sound very, uh, very sexy, right? I mean, but, but, but in a way, it, the, the principle is quite, quite, quite simple, right? There are two main category of tasks, right? I mean, I mean, some people will call it a three main category. It'll be supervised learning, unsupervised learning, and another one will be reinforcement learning, right? So reinforcement learning is probably will need a little bit of a special treatment. So maybe we'll leave it out uh, for the purpose of this uh, presentation. So there'll be two main category of tasks right, or techniques, right? One is called supervised learning. And what is supervised learning is really about, right? So I, I, I always like to use a, a kind of everyday uh, kind of a, a, a example, right? So I think we, we, we have a, a experience of playing with, with babies, right? So sometimes we try to bring the baby down to the neighborhood, uh, to the garden uh, uh, downstairs, and we'll see some animals. Let's say we see cats and, and dog, right? So we're trying to to, to let, teach the baby to recognize uh, the animals, right? So typically what we are doing 
is we'll point the baby to a number of examples, right? So let's say typically we'll point the baby to, okay, those cute animals, they are cat. And this bunch of animals, also very cute, they are dog, right? So after the baby see enough uh, examples, the brain will probably will be able to pick up certain kind of patterns. And then in future, when the baby uh, sees some, some, some animal again, right? Let's say, for example, the dog over here, he was saying, mm, this one looks like pretty much like the, the dog I saw before. So it also should be a dog as well, right? So this is, a, in a way, the supervised learning. So basically, adults would, would basically give baby some kind of a signal where saying, okay, this is a cat and this is dog, right? And sometimes you call different names under different contexts, right? So I think in, in our insurance industry, some, a lot of people are trying to call it a predictive modeling, right? But I think in the old days, a lot of people also call it a pattern recognition as well, right? So this is on the supervised learning side. And there's another type of like techniques which is called the unsupervised learning. So as the name suggests, unsupervised learning basically means there's no supervision, there's no signals to teach the baby, okay, this group of animal are cats and the other group of animal is, is dog, right? So we basically uh, give baby a couple of, uh, of image of, of, of different, different animals, right? And then the baby will look at the, 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 the images and then probably it will try to uh, find a grouping of the examples, right? So you will say, okay, maybe list uh, three uh, images over here, it basically belong to one category of animal and the other three will probably belong to another one. But baby will not know uh, what, or maybe what kind of animal are, are they? Are they really cats or dogs? Probably baby won't know. I still need to rely on adults to tell them, okay, this group is called cats and the other group is called dog, right? But this one is also equally important because it will help us to identify uh, the kind of a certain kind of structure in our data. It will be helpful when we are dealing with a new, uh, new set of data or new problem, right? So this is uh, basically a kind of a, a, a two major category of uh, machine learning techniques uh, in, 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 in the field, right? So let's a bit on the technical uh, aspect. I mean, of course, there'll be a whole load of uh, details about how to deal with overfitting and how to make the model more scalable, right? I mean, of course, this is a whole, whole community of the AI, AI researchers and engineers really like uh, uh, keep them busy or right? let their focus. But I think for the purpose of today's call, I think we just need to keep in mind there's a two, two category of techniques, supervised learning and unsupervised learning. Right. And then in terms of the, uh, the ex, uh, kind of the application in insurance industry, right? I mean, if you, let's say we, we look at the whole industry from, from the, uh, 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 a, 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 the whole in, uh, kind of uh, the, the, the value chain of the, in the, uh, the insurance industry, let's say we, we, we take it from a kind of a product kind of view, right? So let's say we have the first, we need to design a product and then we do the marketing of the product and then we do uh, uh, kind of a risk selection or do underwriting. And then after the, the policy has been sold, we need to do the policy administration and followed by claims. If you look from this pers perspective, AI can play a role in different stage of the whole insurance industry, right? Let's start from the product. So I think for, for product, I think uh, AI or machine learning, right, can play a role to help to improve the, uh, the risk understanding, right? So typically, I think when we are doing uh, pricing, I think our actuary colleagues typically look at, uh, later we'll probably go into a, a much more detail, but Typically, I think when, when our actuary colleagues look at the uh, uh, pricing, right, we usually look at a smaller number of uh, risk factors, right? So, so in a way, I think the, uh, the pricing may not be that grand. I mean, of course, this, that, that happened for certain reasons. But AI, in a way, will come in to give us a more granular pricing or more granular understanding of the risk, right? And then we can even also apply the segmentation to identify new insurable risks, right? We, we kind of do the uh, clustering. And maybe if you still recall the unsupervised learning example, right? We try to group them into different groups, right? And then we try to see whether this group is a kind of a new insurable risk, right? So this is what AI can do in the product uh, stage. But for marketing, it is really about how we can understand our customer better, right? So we're trying to improve the profiling of our customer, right? So typically we'll build a uh, propensity to buy model to help us identify who are more likely to buy certain type of a product, right? So this is, I mean, a lot of uh, a company are, are, are doing. And on the underwriting side, uh, it is really about uh, selecting the, uh, the risk, selecting the better risk, right? So a lot of time we'll build predictive underwriting uh, model to identify the, uh, the good risks. Basically over here, good risks, I mean, of course, it depends on different, uh, different line of business, but typically it means uh, risks are, are, are less likely to claim in the future, right? And at the same time, 
with a predictive underwriting model in place, right? We can, in a way, we can also try to simplify the underwriting process. It can also help to increase the sales, right? So that is the, uh, on the underwriting side, uh, AI can also play a role there. And on the policy administration side, it's really about actively or proactively engage our customer so that we can retain the other customer, right? So let's say we build a model to predict who are more likely to lapse. And for those people, we can, we can reach out to them uh, to engage them so that they can stay on with us. Right? So this is a typical, uh, a typical application of AI in, in policy administration, or some people call it enforced management. And for the claims, right, uh, I think it's really about trying to lower in the claims. Right? We can build, uh, typically we'll try to deal with the uh, fraud detection. Right? We'll build fraud detection models, trying to spot fraudulent claims. Uh, that's that's a very typical application uh, over there. But I mean, of course, for the claims, I think it probably will vary by different line of business as well, right? Let's say for a certain line of business, it, it may not be less straightforward to define uh, which one is it, it, a fraud, right? Because if you still recall the cat and dog example, right? So over here, what we really need to do is we just need to find out who are a fraudulent claim and who is not, uh, what is a fraudulent claim and what is not a fraudulent claim, right? But for a certain line of business, it may not be less straightforward to establish that. For, for example, medical, right? Sometimes a bit difficult to differentiate whether it's really a fraud or maybe just an abuse, right? But the technique is basically the same, right? We, we're trying to identify uh, whether, uh, what is the uh, cat and dog in, in our industry, right? If we're able to establish that, we can apply the uh, civilized learning, right? But if let's say we are not able to, maybe we can use uncivilized learning, trying to group the other data in a way, and then we're trying to bring the human uh, knowledge in there to help us to, to, to figure out which one is cat and which one is dog. And then we apply the uh, uh, civilized learning uh, to build a model, right? So let's say in a way, it, the, the method methodology is more or less very similar uh, in most of the cases, right? And, and recently, uh, AI Singapore has been collaborating uh, with some port, right, to build a model uh, for fraud detection, right? And then this one for, for the travel and, and personal excellent our business, right? So exactly over here, we're applying the uh, civilized learning techniques on uh, trying to pick up uh, which one is really a fraudulent, right? But because we need to spend quite a number of effort to really uh, uh, kind of uh, label the data or to make sure in the historical data we have, which one is a fr fraudulent claim and which one is uh, not a fraudulent claim, right? So in this case, if you, again, we're still link back to the cat and dog kind of example, we're trying to establish which one is cat, which one is dog, right? And typically the quality of the data is very important, right? Because in a way we don't want to point to the baby that like some animal somehow looks like cat, but in fact it's dog, or maybe the other way around, right? Because you may get uh, the baby confused, right? So there's the quality of the data is also quite important uh, over there. So that is a very quick uh, crash course really about, about AI, right? So I think the key message is that there's two types of uh, uh, key techniques, right? One is the supervised learning and the unsupervised learning. And it can play a role in, in, in different stage of the whole uh, 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 value chain, right? And then the quality of the data is very important because we don't want to confuse the model, right? That, that's the, uh, uh, the key message. But it is not just about about technology, right? There are a lot more factors which we need to we need to consider, right? Uh, I over here I list now three more of factors from people to data to business problem, right? So I'll spend a couple of minutes uh, uh, to talk about it, uh, uh, each, to talk about each of them, right? So probably I will start from from people, right? So I think. Uh, I happened to read an article recently in the, in the Harvard Business Review, right? So, so I think it was probably June, the issue of June 2020, right? So it also, uh, the, the article was really about digital transformation, right? And then over there it lists uh, the, uh, the talent is certainly the most important factor for the digital transformation, right? But I mean, of course, AI nowadays is a really a key part of the digital transformation, right? So when you're talking about AI uh, in insurance industry, certainly you can't really uh, avoid this, uh, this, this, this expert or this question, right? And then most, probably more relevant for the colleague here, right? I mean, typically when we talk about AI, a lot of people ask the question, uh, is actually really something uh, uh, gonna be at risk in the age of, of AI? Right? Are we gonna be replaced uh, by AI, right? I think typically when, when I talk to my actuary colleagues, a lot of times jokingly or non-jokingly, we will we'll kind of discuss about, <laughs> about, about this, this topic, right? 
So is it really the case, right? So I think I'll probably uh, 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 offer, I shouldn't say offer an answer, right? But at least we'll offer a, a view into, into this, this, this question, right? So maybe we can start from a, a quick uh, comparison between actual science and in AI, right? I mean, I, uh, the first, I think, uh, typically when we talk about actual science, I need already know that, that a lot of the large numbers are in the key principle, right? I mean, certainly we don't need to go into the, 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 the detail. Everybody probably know much better than, than, than I do. So basically, typically, I think the, 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 the principle over here basically, uh, in a way, uh, 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 dictate, in a way, this that when we are typically analyzing our data or analyzing our, our, our book, right? We'd rather take a kind of a cohort uh, kind of a view, right? We, I mean, when we're doing pricing or either doing uh, uh, reserving or something like that, we typically try to take a cohort view, right? Because we want to keep the yeah, risk pool kind of kind of a kind of a uh, make the law of, of, of a large number at play over here. Right? But on the other hand, I think AI is, is is the focus is probably different, right? So for AI, the goal is really, or the focus is really to predict uh the uh the individual right predict the like, the probability of certain events will happen in future right so if you still recall uh the uh the different uh, kind of a uh, uh uh what i call it the different stage of the uh, of the value chain right so at different stage basically what we're trying to do is all trying to predict like certain things are going to from, from happening right and it kind of a try to to come out the probability of, of that event of, of, of happening right so the focus is really on prediction Right, and then what we really care over here is about the generalization capability of our model, right? So we learn something from our past experience and we are hoping that this pattern is able to apply into the future, right? So that's kind of the focus of AI and which is slightly different from actuary or science, right? And then in terms of the uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, applications, right? Typically, I think, I think for, for, for our actuary uh, kind of a, uh, uh, exercise, so typically it's risk oriented. And most of the time, the problem is probably related to financial uh, kind of problems, right? But on the other hand, I think for AI, it's probably trying to deal with a lot more uh, kind of uh, kind of problems, right? It, for example, I mean, if we, if we recall earlier on, I think we also talked about trying to, 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 to do the marketing, right? Trying to see who are more likely to buy certain things, right? So this is, can also be something which AI can offer help there. Right, rather than just the uh, financial uh, equate, I mean financial problems, right? And then in terms of the methodology, I think for actuary science, right? I mean for 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 our actuary colleagues, a lot of times the uh, explanation is very important. Let's say for example, when we are doing the pricing, we want to know, let's say, compare male and female, right? I mean, how, how much more likely uh, a male cohort is more likely to claim than female, right? So that's why I think this is also the reason why our actuary colleagues would use. Uh, a lot of time we're using the uh, GRM, right, generalized linear model, right, because we, we need that kind of coefficient, that kind of explanation for us is very important, right. And then typically we also use less the unsupervised learning uh, techniques, right. Typically it's a kind of regression. Regression is considered a kind of a supervised learning techniques in AI, right. But for AI, I think we typically, I think uh, we will apply a wider selection of techniques, right. Uh, today we may not have time to go into go into the details, but typically, I mean, like you probably heard about a couple of names: the random forest, gradient boosting trees, neural network, right? But typically, those uh, models they are more uh, complicated, and, and and if you tie to the uh, the focus earlier on, right, because they can predict at the individual level and with a higher accuracy, but the drawback of those kind of model is they don't usually give us coefficient, a nice coefficient as GM usually would do, right? And that's yeah, probably the uh, uh, one or major difference. And then, yes, we use uh, a lot of the time, we use unsupervised learning, especially when, when the target variable is not really available, right? We're trying to use unsupervised learning to help us to kickstart the process, right? And then in terms of the data application of the uh, uh, usage of the data, uh, so I think for our, our actuary uh, exercise, right, typically uh, we look at the uh, attributes or risk factor, which is directly uh, relevant to the problem statement. Let's say for pricing, we typically for life, right? Typically, we look at age, gender, occupation, class, income level, and things like that, right? And then when, when, when sometimes when the data is not really uh, 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 a lot, a lot of data is not really even available, and then we will use our expert uh, knowledge, right? our domain knowledge, to try to fill in the gaps. But for 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 AI, uh, I think on the other hand, usually we we'll look at a, a lot more attributes as much as possible because I think over here the goal again is to predict at the individual level, right? The more the rule of thumb is the more you include, you typically will improve your model, right? 
And then a lot of times we also look into uh, so-called something we call it the unstructured data, including uh, text and, and image, right? So I think those are kind of a, in a way is probably uh, uh, a bit like a, the, the difference or comparison between the two uh, practice or two 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 type of the other uh, school of the uh, the science, right? But having said that, I mean there's a difference there, right? But certainly the more collaborations between our actuary or practice and the AI should certainly uh, be fostered and promoted, right? And then we do see this kind of a trend is, is happening, right? Uh, I think the, uh, the two major uh, professional body in our industry, right, IFOA and SOA, SOA right, they all in a way have have changed or in a way of changing the syllabus to include more uh, content about machine learning and, and, and predictive analytics, right. And then this year, there's also, <clears throat> I think it was a, a, a casualty actual society, and there was a US-based uh, uh, organization, right. They give, every year, they, they give a award to, 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 to uh, give an award annually. So this year, I think they give their award to a paper which is called AI in Actuary or Science, Science, right? So over there, I mean, if you have a time, I would suggest you probably you can download this paper and have a reading about it because it, over there it contains a lot of uh, interesting applications of AI in our actuary practice, including uh, reserving, including uh, pricing, right? So this is, and then also including the analysis of telematics data. Right. So this is the example, which is I also included on, on the right hand side over here, right? So they apply a, a neural network and try to analyze the, uh, 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 the telematics data and try to use uh, the two dimensional data, which after the transformation to use that as a kind of a factor in the GOM to really do the pricing, right? So that's what you can see that the, our actuary or practice in the AI in a way is already trying to kind of uh, working hand in hand to solve the issues in the industry, right? So, so I would say, going back to my earlier question, I mean, the, the, the question, whether it's going to impact our, uh, our actuary uh, colleagues, right? I would say it probably will be, the answer probably is not. My personal answer, my personal view to that probably is not, right? So it's a bit like, uh, probably as an actuary plus AI intelligence, it probably will create a new breed of uh, our talent, it's called intelligent actuary, right? That's my personal hope, right? And I, I think I, I did see the, the, the trend is happening. Right, so that's the first uh, uh, aspect I want to talk is about the uh, uh, talent, right? And the second one I want to touch on is about data, right? So I personally like this uh, diagram very much. Uh, so over here you can see AI is at the top of the pyramid of the needs. Right? I think mean, everybody probably heard about the Maslow, uh, the pyramid of, of the needs of a human, right? So over here, there's some smart uh, data scientists also come up with this, this, this same structure, right? they, they call it the data science hierarchy of the, need, uh, the needs. So over here, you can see AI and the deep learning and stay on the top, right? Uh, so basically equivalent to the self-actuation uh, in, 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 in human, right? But we first, we need to, we need water, food, and shelter. So same for data science or AI, same, right? We need data and related infrastructure and data collection and management to really make data available for us to do the uh, AI project, right? So that's the importance of the data, but the reality in our industry, I mean, most of the line of business, right? I mean, it, it probably in a way, it, they are low frequency by nature, right? So, so typically, I think when we are talking about customer or we're talking about visibility of our customer, typically we have two touch points with our customer, right? So one is when the customer buy or renew a policy. So the other one is when the customer claims, right? So I think that in a way, make the data available in insurance industries probably uh, low in, in, in volume and also low in, in quality, right? Uh, but I think, so that's why I think it will trigger us to look into alternative source of data, right? A lot of companies trying to, to do that, right? So over here, the example is that we're trying to look into, let's say, uh, work with non-insurance companies like banks, uh, like internet companies, trying to get their data to help us to build a better model, right? So that's what we mean by alternative source of data, which is not a conventional insurance data, right? So insurance data, we talk about claim, we, we talk about enforced book, and things like that. But we try to bring in uh, non-insurance data to, to augment the data we have, right? So that's probably the, the way uh, I, uh, uh, moving forward, right? But on the other hand, there's also a privacy concern over there, right? Because I think uh, in Singapore, we have a PDPA, right? And then also I think in, in, in Europe, we have the PDPA. So those kind of, uh, yeah. So those kind of uh, regulations, right? In a way, uh, they, they have a very strict regulation around data sharing. Right. So I think it's probably not less straightforward. It's just 
you want to get other people's data, just go ahead and get it, right? So this may not be less straightforward to share data as, as we want. So, so obviously, I know there's, there's some recent development in machine learning community or AI community. There's a new tenet is called federated learning, right? So the idea, in a way, is is quite straightforward, right? So, so basically, the idea is like we don't really share the raw data, right? So we share, but we share model instead. So basically, the idea is that let's say assuming there's multiple parties, right? So let's say insurance company have this data over here, and then if you're another company, which is the internet company, you have your data over here, right? So previously, we tried to bring the two data together, put into a centralized location, and do the model, do the modeling, right? But federated learning, in a way, uh, the, uh, the methodology is you don't need to share the data to me, right? You build your local model, right? Because the model is just a bunch of parameters, a bunch of weight, right? And then after you build a model, you send it to a global party, and this global party will do the aggregation. Right. I mean, of course, there will be a quite a sophisticated kind of a mass uh, involved. But the idea is simple, right? We don't really share the raw data, right? And then the benefit, in a way, you will probably try to address the concern of data privacy because the data is still uh, within your own pocket, right? You didn't really take out the data, right? And there's a two type of a kind of a main category of federated learning, right? So one is something we call the horizontal. Horizontal basically means that uh, uh, different party have more or less more homogeneous data. Right. For example, I think maybe we we'll take insurance as an example. Maybe the company within our industry that will come together uh, to build the model together. Right. That can be a one a kind of a use case of horizontal federated learning. Right. On the other hand, it's more like a vertical. So vertical is really like a different party uh, has uh, heterogeneous data. Right. Let's say assuming one party is your insurance, and then we have the target variable over here, which is the claim experience. Right. And the other party, like party B or party C, they contain uh, other set of uh, features or other set of uh, 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 attributes about the same uh, person which you want to build, right? Let's say it can be from uh, internet company or from e-commerce company, right? So those are, are technically, uh, they are all possible. Right? And they also in AI Singapore, also trying to build a platform to support this two, uh, kind of a category of federal learning, right? So I think that's in a way is uh, technically we are able to really help to address the issue of getting more data at the same time, uh, to be a more like privacy compliant kind of a way, right? Uh, I'm, I'm coming to the end of my slide soon, right? So another one is the, about the business problem, right? Because I think uh, we have been doing uh, quite a number of projects in, in the industry and other industry as well, right? And then we see some common uh, 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 problem here, right? So I mean, typically a lot of people will say, okay, now okay, I have this data, right? Just go ahead and make it make AI happen, right? Uh, and a lot of people will probably feel, okay, AI is just equal to BI right just business intelligence just do some reporting right and it's, it's good and then a lot of people sometimes also people feel okay ai is really magic right uh i can show you any any problem statement and you're able to help me right but those are not really the truth right so picking the right problem statement to address is very important because if you, if you look on the right, left hand side this is something called crisp dm right it's called cross industry standard process for data mining right i think this is still it, it was kind of a uh, created about 20 years ago, right? but I think even now it's still quite relevant for, for, for AI, right? So basically it means uh, the understanding of the business problem will guide our all the, the other activities, right? It will, guide, it will guide us what kind of data we need to get and how do we really process our data, right? So I think to get the business problem right is very uh, important. So that's why I think in AI Singapore, we, we, we do like help, uh, I mean, like create a structured program to help our partners right, to really like on, on board the, uh, the AI journey, right? From a bit like, a, 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 let us know your problem statement or let us know your, your pain points. And then we have a kind of a different activities to really help you to distill a reasonable uh, AI problem statement, which your data is able to solve, right? And then this is a kind of an impact. Today, I don't really have time to go into that, but it is an important thing. It's not, it, AI take away messages like, AI can help you, but AI may not be able to help you with everything, right? We need to understand what data we have and we also need to understand what kind of a, a business problem is there, right? So that is the, uh, uh, <clears throat> I think that I'm at the last slide of my, of my presentation, right? So basically the key takeaway is the first is that AI has a, certainly has an important role to play uh, in multiple areas of the industry, of our industry, right? And then AI and then actually science certain issues work hand in hand, and then certainly it is happening already, right? If you look at the, uh, the IFOA and SOA is doing, certainly the trend is going there. And last but not least, I think people and data are all important assets. 
if you're really talking about accessible AI adoption and application in our industry, right? Then, yeah, thanks for your attention. Yeah, thanks. Maybe uh, some, some uh, questions. Yes, thank you, Jess. Thank you very much for this uh, great presentation. Yes, uh, we, we can see how the, the AI is used in the, in the insurance industry, in project pricing claims about digital transformation of insurance industry right. and how the actuaries can collaborate with uh, artificial intelligence with their activities. And th there was a great uh, comparison between the, the, the AI and, and actuaries tasks and, and skills. So that's, uh, that's really, really interesting. Uh, thank you very much for, for this presentation. Um, let me have a look if, uh, if we have uh, some questions from, from the, uh, the attendees. Yes, we have one question uh, for you, JS. So, yeah. uh, so yes, so uh, actuaries typically use uh, GLM for pricing, especially right. for motor pricing. Right. Uh, if actuaries uh, were to use uh, matching learning at least to identify risk factors and then use a GLM model with those identified risk factors, do you think that it is a reasonable approach? Yeah, c certainly, right. Certainly it is an important, uh, I mean, it is a reasonable uh, approach, right. And talking about, because, I mean, it happened to, okay, let me reshare my screen. Uh, just give me a second. Uh, because one of the slides which I shared earlier on, right, which is the, uh, uh, the, uh, the award list here, is also about uh, uh, telematics data, which is also related to, to motor pricing, right? So, I mean, indeed, yes, I mean, sometimes we deal with a lot of uh, uh, risk factors. Right? I mean, of course, over there, which one is more important, which one is less important? It is, I mean, in, in machine learning uh, practice, it's also an important uh, topic, which is something we call it the future selection, right? There's a couple of ways uh, we, we, we can do it. I mean, like a typical way is, oh, you can probably do like regularization, right? You're trying to apply certain kind of a penalty uh, uh, in, your, in, your, in, your, in, your, in your model, right? So that you could, in a way, it will help you to, to select those that are more important and, and more, uh, I mean, having more predictive power, so-called, in, in, your, in, in your model, right? So there's one way of doing that. And this particular paper, which I'm citing, I mean, I'm, I'm putting on, on, on this particular slide, right? Uh, they use a, a, a even more interesting approach, right? They are not just looking at the, uh, the so-called the raw risk factors. They apply, uh, so they first they build something which is called a VA, uh, what they call it here, VA map, the, the velocity and accelerate, uh, acceleration, right? So that uh, they, 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 they basically uh, use uh, the feature which is already in the, uh, the raw data and then they apply the, uh, uh, something we call the auto encoder, right? So auto encoder probably can be uh, compared to something called PCA, principal component analysis, right? But PCA is probably more linear one, but auto encoder in a way is probably non-linear one. Right? But basically you can just imagine you are trying to map your original high dimensional data into a two dimensional sorry, two dimensional, right? Over here you can see that, that dimension one, dimension two, right? So basically you use these two in a way as your new so-called, uh, 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 what they call it, the pricing factor, and, and then take this one into consideration in your GRM models, right? So, I mean, certainly it is a reasonable uh, approach to use, yeah. Right. Sorry, okay, I, 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 yes. Yeah, yeah, I, I forgot to unmute. It's okay. Yeah, I, I just say, tell you thank you for your your answer, and uh, it's uh, it's it's more clear, I think, for for the, the to answer the question. And thank you, Salia, for your your question. Uh, I'm checking if there is any uh, other question re regarding the, the the presentation. Um, yes, I I was wondering. Yes, um, a machine learning uh, algorithm. Is a blind virtuoso capable of performing a given learning task upon a massive data set with uh, the utmost efficiency? However, if the assumptions underlying uh, the, that initial learning scenario are not longer met, the result could be anything from useless to sinister, right? So understanding these uh, assumptions uh, within an insurance context and what it means when they are not met uh, will be the, the future of uh, the future actuaries uh, uh, bread and butter, no? <laughs> I'm not saying that to show that actuaries uh, 
that everything will be all right for them or even more, but uh, just thinking about the role of the actuaries in the field. But I think you made a, a great comparison between the, 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 the actuary skills and, uh, and the, the artificial intelligence. And in this way, I, I'm thinking that, uh, yes, actuaries probably can collaborate more and more with the artificial intelligence, right? Mm -hmm. Right. So, so yeah, I mean, this is certainly, uh, I mean, uh, as I mentioned in, in, in uh, earlier on uh, slide, right? I mean, certainly, yes, I mean, uh, act, our actual colleagues, uh, yeah, I mean, we, we probably need to look beyond uh, the tools in our current toolbox, right? There are yeah. some more advanced modern techniques in, in the other camp of the, uh, the, the, the community, right? I mean, the, uh, in this case, machine learning, right? And then it, it was probably, to certain extent, it will probably change the way how we do do certain things. Right? I mean, as I mentioned earlier, on, maybe with more data and a more more uh, advanced or uh, modern techniques, we may even go uh, uh, what they call the very individual level of price making because you can really like like give a probability of, of certain people going to claim future. Right? We can probably do that with, with AI techniques, but I think we probably also need to keep in one thing in mind. Right? I mean, the the the, the insurance has a, has the uh, social welfare element in, in there, right? Because if you really go to the to the extreme, like just push for the, the individual level kind of a kind of a model, right? So it, it might make insurance very expensive and may not be affordable for, for a certain group of people, right? I think this is probably something we just need to need to keep in mind. And probably we need to find a, a, a balance here, right? And then I, I personally feel that, that our actual colleagues probably were at best uh, position to do to do that kind of a balance because they know the insurance risk and they know the market, they know the product very well, right? And then they just need to pick up the, the techniques to help their, their their daily jobs, right? So I think I would say this is certainly a very good, uh, 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 what do you call it, the uh, marry of, of the, uh, the, the two, two factors. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, GS. For I hope your, you answered your question, yeah. Yes, yes, definitely. Thank you, thank you very much. Thanks. Uh, let me check if you have uh, any other question. <coughs> um, so maybe we can uh, move to the second uh, speaker. Thank you very much, Jesse. Jess. Thanks, Rila. Thank you. Yeah, okay, so let me introduce the, the second speaker, Jack Zia. Yeah? Uh, so Jack is, uh, uh, Jack is the chief actuary of the regional leading insure tech startup called Igloo. He is responsible for managing risk with big data, cloud computing, matching learning and uh, predictive modeling, a veteran uh, to connect insurance uh, with digital economy and using uh, cutting edge uh, technology. So Jack will uh, present the AI governance framework issued in Singapore and uh, its application in the insurance industry. He will explain what is the important request when doing AI in terms of organization and solution proposed by, uh, by AI. He will go through some case studies framework not related to insurance and give some examples for insurance and discuss how to fit the principle uh, for a better understanding of uh, using uh, artificial intelligence. So I will let you uh, start your presentation uh, now, uh, Jack if you are ready. Yeah, sure. Okay, so thank you for the introduction. And I think uh, in the last presentation, we've seen a very uh, good explanation of what AI is and how it works. So now I'm going to talk about more about AI governance and also some applications and samples in insurance. So personally, I'm an actuary uh, from SOA and I'm trying to be one of the artificial, of a, let's say, uh, the uh, intelligent actuary uh, as described by the last presenter. So I joined an uh, initial test startup called Igloo. So, but we don't want to really uh, do too much marketing of Igloo. And because we're a regional player, I believe we have talked to most of the insurance in the region. So if you see anything interesting in this presentation, you can talk to us. So let's come to today's uh, topic of AI governance. So, uh, the Singapore government actually released this uh, notes on the model artificial intelligence governance framework. So that's the second edition where the uh, government updated a few things on the AI's internal governance and human involvement, uh, operation management and stakeholder interactions. So it's a very long but quite intuitive uh, guideline for people to take a look. 
So today we will build our uh, presentation based on all these uh, requirements. So uh, before that, let's just go back to review some basics of AI. So uh, the definition is AI is kind of the way to seek to simulate human uh, behavior to solve problems, uh, do perception, learning, planning, and so on. So actually there are three words that are commonly used and people uh, kind of confuse between them. That is artificial intelligence, machine learning, and big data. So in the previous one, we see that machine learning is a subset of uh, artificial intelligence. So for example, right, may, you may have an, something less than an AI, but uh, probably in the earlier days, people just use a lot of if and else to program something that looks like an AI, but actually it's not. So, but when these problems are too complicated, you cannot write a lot of if and else, then you have to use machine learning to solve a more complicated problem. And also big data is also uh, a very interesting topic that has a uh, interaction with machine learning and artificial intelligence, but it can be a very challenging problem even without AI and machine learning. So for example, nowadays uh, people use some devices to track uh, the movement of cars, like a uh, usage-based insurance for cars. So suppose you have such devices installed a million cars and probably you receive say one gigabyte of data every second from all these cars. Then even without any machine learning or artificial intelligence, it's a challenge to just uh, store this data and analyze data and make sense out of it. But today we will uh, cover mostly uh, artificial intelligence and a more machine learning side of the uh, artificial intelligence. So uh, after reading this uh, guideline, I will say the most important takeaway is this guiding principles. And this is a direct quote from, from this guideline. So it says the organizations should ensure that AI decision-making process are explainable, uh, transparent, and fair, and while AI solutions should be human-centric. So you will see there are four keywords here. And all the AI solutions, we need to check these four keywords, explainable, transparent, fair, and human-centric. But when we say a word, uh, a model is like a machine learning model, then definitely it's not uh, fully explainable because the parameters are just uh, some parameters data by model. It won't be fully transparent because uh, you don't really know what's really going on there, but at least we can make some effort to make sure at least the process of building the model, the process of selecting the data is transparent. And FAIR is uh, a bit controversial, I'd say, in, to, in many sense, and especially for, in, for insurance. Uh, probably insurance is the only industry where uh, we allow different rates by gender and age. And in most other industries, you cannot charge a different rate. So that makes, uh, or say insurance, machine learning, even more controversial, right? I mean, also we talk about the social welfare elements that how do we make sure that we don't make insurance too expensive for certain group of people. So the last one is a human centric. I would say the, the government really requires uh, our modelers to consider how do we keep human in the loop. So if you compare the, the chart on the right, right? So we have to estimate the uh, severity and probability of the, the incident or the, or the case that we try to use AI. So if we use low severity and low probability events, so in such cases, we can keep human out of the loop. And to further explain these four, these four requirements, I picked some examples. So they are the examples uh, from, the, uh, from the guideline and under the guidance of the government. And so let's go through how do they fit all these four principles. So the first one is a very famous one, the graph. So I guess everyone took a graph trip before. So the application is how they allocate trips for drivers and customers. So uh, they claim to use an AI model and I believe it's true because uh, it's, it's quite complicated uh, to, to allocate trips. And because uh, they allocate about 5,000 trips every minute, so the argument is it's not, uh, it's not possible to keep human in the loop to make all the decisions. And so while they use AI, they, they, they kind of feel that it's little or no harm for a less than optimal um, trip application. So in the end, they will keep a human out of loop approach for this problem on how to allocate, allocate trips. So this is really to address, address the last one. So if the problem is uh, low severity and low uh, likelihood, then we can use AI and keep it out of loop. 
So then the second one is the pure matrix. So haven't heard of it before, but uh, the, the sample is that they help an enterprise companies build more diverse teams of, of, the top, of the top performers, where the consideration is they will debias all the AI models that they, they build to, to help enterprise build teams to ensure they are fully presentable of the environment that they may function in. So this is really they keep human in the loop where if the bias is found, then the company will adjust the AI model to optimize for fairness. So this is a more, more to address fairness. And actually this can be a quite uh, tricky problem. I would say uh, in our normal days, then probably we would like to uh, work more with people who, for example, uh, speak the same language, speak the same dialect, and eat the same food. Probably it's more convenient. But uh, in some sense, it's, the team is not diverse enough. So in the long term, there will be some, some impacts. So then this, uh, this company try to use some AI tools to, to help to diverse the teams. So this is more to address the fairness requirements. Okay, then the Facebook. So Facebook is, uh, has an application in the new feeds feature, where if you see something new feeds in Facebook and also nowadays some other things like linking or something, you will see a, a question mark where I say, why am I seeing this post? So this feature explains how user interactions uh, impact the, the ranking of the posts in news feeds. And they also explain the rationale for key updates and give provide details on how the Facebook system works. Of course, all these explanations are not really produced by, by, by the, directly by the model itself. The model is still kind of a black box, but Facebook and the engineers can try to make sense out of it and try to make it uh, uh, explainable and transparent. So Facebook is trying to address the two requirements, explainable and transparent, by uh, explaining why am I seeing this post. Okay, so the last one is uh, MSD. So it's a company that use in-house chatbot to answer queries on IT related matters. So when we say a chatbot, then there's uh, usually some AI behind where uh, the, the, the employees can just ask them any random question and the chatbot will try to answer. So how they do is they have a user experience team conduct user research to understand the user's expectation better and improve the interaction and uh, analyze how, how the employees reacted. And also, they also understand that uh, the chatbot cannot understand, cannot answer all the questions. I mean, even you use like all those chat, chatbots by, by uh, Apple and Amazon, right? I mean, probably they will answer most of the questions, but even the best technology nowadays cannot answer all the questions. So they will have a maximum of three attempts before a human in, 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 gets in the loop. So this is more to address, um, I would say the last question, um, when, in which cases can you, uh, do you need a human in the loop and in which cases you need to keep human out of the loop. Okay, of course there are a few other examples in the guideline you can take a look yourself. But unfortunately there is no direct insurance applications in, the, in, the, in this guideline. So I'm, I'm presenting a few uh, examples that we thought of in Igloo and actually we're using some of these with our partners. So, I mean, if you have any questions, you can ask later, but if you're interested in any of these uh, technologies, you can work with us. So probably we can uh, launch some product together. And, and later, and because later I also explain some background. So if you want to learn something, probably you can host, uh, we will, uh, SAS will host a session to uh, teach you how to build something simple. Okay, so the first one is a chatbot. I would say we can just refer to the animation on the left, but that's uh, just forget about an animation. Let's uh, explain how a chatbot works. So uh, how a chatbot works is a chatbot is designed to answer some questions by, by human. So for example, uh, we expect a question of, uh, uh, we will design a question of, uh, do you want to start the coverage? And then we will have a very specific requirement that this question only has two answers and probably the other answer that it doesn't fit any, any of these two. So the first answer is yes. So the human, and the second answer is no. So the human will try to program this question and yes and no. So then we have some AI to interpret these questions. So the customer can input any, any random, uh, random answer, but 
this will interpret. So hey, let's go back to the animation. So I'll say hi. Then the chatbot say hello, do you want coverage? I say okay. So okay is interpreted as yes. So it asks me, is it do we want a monthly or annual coverage? Then I say months. So it will interpret as monthly, so it will ask something. I'll say send thanks. Then will say my pleasure. And I'll say something, you are so cute. Then if the smart AI will answer you some question like you're a small talker. But the art about this chatbot is that if I answer maybe, then it's not input interpreted as yes or no. So it will answer something else. So if I answer definitely, then the, you can program the AI to interpret definitely as a yes and continue. But for example, we have a requirement for monthly or annually, but you can program the AI to interpret yearly as annually. So, so that's, about, uh, that's the art about this chatbot that the AI is really uh, helping you to interpret the answer and to allocate the answer to one of the expected answers. Or the AI will determine that the answer doesn't belong to any of these. You want to ask a question at the end or you want to get a human in the loop. Okay, so let's uh, go over this round again. Uh, then we move to the next round. Next question. So I say maybe not a yes or no. So question stands, stops. I say hi and the, the loop starts again. I say definitely, then it's, uh, it's a yes by the program. And I say, if I say annual, then it's definitely annual, but I can say a few variations. I say, I say yearly, then it's also interpreted as annual. Okay, so uh, the second very um, popular example on AI is about recommendations, but I don't have any animation of uh, recommendation systems. So, but if you buy things online on um, say, uh, Lazada, Amazon, you will see that once you bought something, then you will pop you a lot of similar things. So this is how a recommendation system works in, in I would say, e-commerce. But uh, we don't really see too much uh, imp implementation in insurance. But this is one of the Grab's uh, uh, insurance and page where they offer right cover and travel cover. And because they only have two of them, so they will just list up the two, two of them. And at the later stage, when the app goes more complicated, then for example, if you're in China, then you'll see all these Alipay and WeChat Pay, they offer uh, dozens or hundreds of different insurance coverage, then based on, your, your, based on your account and your behavior, or even how much money you have, then they will recommend the product most, most suitable for you. So how the model works is this, right? So you have a customer profile uh, in the app or in your, your insurance company, right? So, and this is your, your internal data. And as the last presentation we see, sometimes we have some uh, external data or, or data from alternative source where you know the conversion rate when uh, people purchase different products. So for example, I, 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 buy a, I, buy a, I buy a phone online. Probably I want to buy a, a accident coverage for my phone. So I put a trip online, then I probably, the model should recommend the travel insurance coverage. So the model will combine all these information together and build an AI model and recommend the, pr recommend the preferred product for each customer. So this recommendation can be done at the customer level. And in some sense, we can argue, um, I would say this, for this uh, kind of AI, we can keep customer out of the loop. Cause uh, if, you keep the, if you keep the fixed premium, you don't discriminate premium, by the customer profile and just recommend a product, then oh, there was also little harm in recommending the, the wrong product. The worst case is the customer will not buy it. So there was some, I would say there was some uh, keep, uh, keep human in the loop or out of loop considerations in this model. Okay, so then underwriting, I would say uh, you can do a lot of things for underwriting uh, in insurance. And here's a more interesting example on use visual uh, visual analysis or image analysis technology for underwriting. For example, you want to cover some, some products. On the leftmost, you will see, uh, for example, I want to buy a coverage my phone. I submit a photo to verify the phone is in, the, is in good condition. So then you can have some model to aut aut automatically identify there is an iPhone in the photo. So the, so the customer just need to submit the photo once. So you don't need, to re you don't need a customer service to reveal the photo. But then, for example, you want to have some car insurance. So then the customer can submit a photo of the car, then the model can tell uh, what's the car brand or the car model from this car. So if you look at the animation in the middle, it's kind of uh, one possible application in underwriting where 
you can ask the customer to upload uh, certificates, maybe a personal ID or a certificate of a car or, or anything, anything with a lot of text in there. Because in the old days, we asked the customer to manually input all this information. And it's, uh, it takes time and it's also possible that you have typo here and there. But if we use an AI to recognize uh, these text from this photo and help the customer to input, the user experience will be, will be much better. And actually we see a lot of companies trying to do this. So to implement these models, right, basically uh, there were at least two approach, two methods, and actually you can use a hybrid of the two. Take the iPhone, for example, right? All these uh, big tech players like Google, Facebook, Amazon, uh, Microsoft, they have their cloud solutions. And they provide some cloud APIs to identify what product is there in the photo. So basically you just provide a photo of the iPhone and ask one of these guys, maybe ask Google, uh, is iPhone in the photo? Google will tell me yes and no. And what's the probability that they find the iPhone in the photo? So if the Google tell you there's definitely iPhone, then probably you will pass them already. So then uh, the method two is more of like the dog and cat example. So it's more for, it's for more specific problems. So for example, I would say, maybe you have the car insurance and you want to uh, do something special about the car, some special, you want to do some special model for the car, then you can train a model to identify like cat or dog. So uh, to ask the model, does, the, does this car look like something you've trained before? So the model will tell you. Okay, so the last example is about claims, right? And I will say this is the most exciting part about uh, AI in insurance. You will see a lot of uh, companies try to do smart insurance claims. And it's actually uh, has been quite successful in, in more advanced uh, places like uh, China and US where some players can just automate everything, uh, can automate 80 to 90% of car claims and that reduce uh, operation costs significantly, significantly and improves customer satisfaction. So what all this model does is basically the user upload a photo of the car with the damaged parts. So then the model will, will tell you, I mean, what is the damage, what's the area of damage and what type of damage. And some advanced players will also tell you how much it costs to replace or repair the, this, this part of the car. So for example, the first one is totally damaged, probably have to replace the whole piece. The second one is a dent. The third one is a scratch. So after understanding the area and the degree and the type, then it's possible, and then first of all, you can definitely recommend a better way for the customer to repair the car. And if you have enough data and enough resource, you can probably build a model to give a call immediately. And this is what at least I heard of um, China, uh, China's ping insurance is doing. So they can just, if you submit a photo, they can just give a quote immediately within uh, a few seconds. So that's worth for, I heard probably 80 to 90% of the claims. Only the more, more complicated 20% need to go to a human inspector. So here's an animation on how it works. Uh, let's wait a bit. Let's wait for it to start again. So I can go through the whole process again. Yeah, by the way, this is a demo app by, by, by us. Okay, so for example, you want to cause damage, then you want to get assessments. At the first, you don't really know what damage it is. So it can be from any angle of any part. But if you ask the customer to upload a few photos, then uh, combined with all these AI models, you, the model will tell uh, which part of the car is damaged. You will see is the front bumper and with this orientation. And also it will tell you that the damage is actually a scratch. And after, tele, after understanding all these, then uh, combined with the insurance internal data, so it's probably okay, you can probably get an estimate on how much it might cost. Uh, does it fall under your, 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 your access or uh, do you want to, do you, do you recommend the customer to, to go to a service center? Or do you, do you recommend the customer to repair themselves? Okay, so that's all for my presentation. Hope you uh, have learned something. And, and if you're interested in any of these uh, ideas, you can talk to me or you can go to our website to explore what kind of other solution we provide. So that's all for my presentation. Thank you.
Thank you, Jack. Yeah. Thank you very much. Sorry, I have a technical issue. <laughs> That's okay now. <laughs> Thank you very much. It was really interesting. Very. Uh, uh, this it was a great, great presentation, and it, we can understand now that uh, the Singapore AI governance framework require uh, a human-centric uh, AI solution, and and you you have given examples where AI can keep the the human out of the loop for low severity and low probability scenarios. So um, yes, it, it was really interesting. And, and we can see that uh, insurer can try for their first AI implementation chat box, if I'm not wrong, and uh, image or video analysis to process underwriting or claims requests automatically. Yeah. Yeah, that was uh, really interesting. Thank you very much. It's, uh, it's more clear for this part, for this topic on, on, on AI. Um, regarding the, the governance framework, uh, I, was, uh, I, I was thinking that, yes, we can see the, 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 that AI can be used by organizations to provide new goods and services, boost uh, productivity, enhance uh, competitiveness, ultimately leading to economic growth and a better quality of, uh, of life. Uh, as with any uh, new technology, however, uh, AI also introduced new ethical, legal, and, and uh, governance uh, challenges. Uh, this includes risks of uh, unintended discrimination potentially leading to unfair outcomes, as well as issues relating to consumer uh, knowledge about how AI is uh, involved in making significant or sensitive decisions about them. So I, I was thinking how to build uh, stakeholders' confidence in, in AI through organization responsible use of AI to manage different risks in AI deployment because uh, stakeholders can be skeptical, no? Uh, so does it mean that uh, organizations should detail a set of ethical principles uh, when they embark on deployment of AI uh, within their processes or to empower their project uh, and or uh, services? So does, do they have to do in, the, in, in parallel of the, the deployment of AI or what is, the, what, what, what is done in, in the market usually? Okay, so personally, I'm an actuary, right? So my personal views is AI is not ready to replace the job of actuaries. <laughs> Actually, <laughs> to be but honest. That's a good news. Right. That's a good news. <laughs> So I would say um, all of the, the actual models uh, developed has been, I mean, the actuaries have been developed models for the last probably a century or so. And use a lot of data and modeling, uh, modeling techniques. But I would say AI and the, I would say when, when we talk about model, right? A model is the best answer given a, a certain level of constraints, right? So, I mean, if you have these assumptions and you have this target, then probably the, this model give you the best answer possible in theory. But what AI tries to do is you don't set any assumption. You just uh, use the data to learn itself. For example, in the previous cat and dog uh, example, right? You don't really tell any feature of dog or any feature of cat. You just provide a lot of a lot of photos of cat and dog and let the model learn itself. The drawback of this approach is you require a lot of data and it's difficult to explain. But for insurance, I would say there were two things. The first one is although insurers believe we have a lot of data, but actually the dimension of data we have in our system is very limited. For example, we, we only have age and gender for our product then probably a linear model give us the best answer possible right, by the law of large numbers. I mean, any AI should give us the same answer. Doesn't matter what kind of algorithm they use because that's the only best answer possible. And the other thing is, I would say, uh, that's the special thing about uh, insurance I mentioned previously. Insurance is probably the only industry that we are allowed to charge a different price based on age and gender. So if you use age and gender to differentiate price for any other industry, then it's discrimination. Right. Yeah. So I would say use a purely AI, pure AI model to, to, to price a product without uh, understanding of the algorithm behind it uh, will be very, very challenging mm. uh, for now. So 
that's why what I see in the market is any implementation of AI is more focused on uh, all those add-on service where uh, like a chatbot or, or uh, underwriting where underwriting you, you just uh, look at the photos or look at the data to have some decisions or claims you use AI to recognize photos and so on. And for all these, you, I mean, all the companies will have a limited number of tries for these AI models. And when the customer uh, want to get a human in the loop, then the customers do have a choice. But of course, if you build a good app, you build a good product, build a good app, then most customers will, will prefer these automated solutions. You know, because uh, waiting for transfer service will take a few minutes. So the key here for insurer is that find a problem that is uh, less severe and try to build some AI models and at least find a good team of uh, engineers and product managers and actuaries to make sure that the customers like your product and they will prefer to use it, use the automated solution than, than, the, human, than the human customer service. Mm. So slowly you will build your experience on these uh, not so severe problems. So once you've built enough uh, experience, probably you can use a more, a more, I would say a better AI model for your core business. And also to go back to my previous, uh, the, the, the first step of definition of AI, right? Uh, what I see now is insurance, insurance companies, core business, I would say AI is probably not really the most important uh, critical factor now. The insurance need to, insurers also need to understand that um, big data is also coming uh, now and coming very soon to many players, right? So we now we are going into the world of uh, IoT where we collect a lot of uh, information from devices. And we have, when we have millions of devices in the world, the first step is really how do you store and process all this data before you can, before you can uh, like implement any AI on the data. So you need the infrastructure ready. So then once you have the infrastructure ready, you have very complicated data from all these uh, devices, then uh, because the data is so complicated, then there is no way out. I mean, AI is the only solution and you have to do it. But on the other hand, if we just look at our life insurance where uh, premium is only based on age, age and gender, then I mean, AI and uh, general linear model should give you the same answer. So there is uh, not so much value adding from, from using AI model. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for this, uh, this answer, uh, Jack. It's, uh, it's quite clear. Um, we have received uh, uh, many questions from the, the attendees. So, to, so uh, I will relay them. Uh, the first question from uh, Jeremy, can, uh, can the presenter, so uh, Jack, can you share any examples of uh, customers complaining or suing companies with chatbot recommendation and uh, what are the common practices to avoid this, uh, these incidents? Mm, I would say there is no way to, I would say, I haven't really heard of any uh, customer complaint for chatbots recommendation. No, because the, the, the key thing is here, you cannot discriminate customers by your recommendation model. Whatever you recommend to customer, the premium rate should be the same as the same product recommended to other customers. So at least the customer cannot uh, charge you, uh, cannot raise a ticket for discrimination, right? And also on the other hand, uh, you need to program your, your model smartly. That every time you recommend a different product to, to a different customer. So at least the customer will not only receive the same recommendation every time that the customer feel it's a discrimination. And the thirdly, I would say it's how you choose your parameters in, in your model, right? So uh, I would say probably if you don't choose your parameters carefully, then maybe uh, some customers will find some, something in common together and find some discrimination of your model. But so for a lot of sensitive data, I mean, there, was, there were laws about insurance that what kind of um, parameters you cannot use as a pricing factor. 
So you have to make sure they, all these uh, data are not uh, building into your model. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Jack. Uh, there is another question uh, related to the gender differentiation uh, from uh, Philip. So he says that uh, gender differentiation is against the law in insurance in certain countries. Yeah. So he, he's arguing, uh, uh, and then he asked the question, so directors in companies are held accountable for ensuring their companies comply with anti-discrimination laws. Uh, will actuaries in these companies uh, be able to understand uh, sufficiently their AI-based models to be able to certify to their management board members that uh, the AI models uh, that they uh, use are not uh, discriminatory? I would say uh, that's a question that's quite relevant to the previous one. So do you want to be an yeah. uh, intelligent actuary? <laughs> so I would say um, actually these days a lot of, there were a lot of online courses to explain how AI works and what are the uh, logic behind. So for actually it's right, we, we don't really have to uh, understand the, the, the background, the, the backgrounds, uh, basic the background knowledge about how a neural network, neural network work. And we don't have to like how, try to assemble a neural network ourselves. But at least we should learn some basics of, um, of how an AI model works and when we try to build some models, we should have some common sense of how it works and how to explain the model. And if I have a model, then what are the likely outcomes? So to some extent, so, so at least we can justify the model to some extent. So personally, I do, I take a lot of uh, online courses on Coursera. Probably I took uh, a few dozen relevant courses. No, but that's more mostly because I'm working in an insurtech company. So uh, we, we use a lot of these every day, but uh, for at least for the younger actuaries, I would suggest that you try to learn more machine learning, AI, cloud computing, because uh, the trend is definitely coming. So if you learn all this early, you will have some advantages because I would say in the near future, we will see AI-driven model uh, use in the industry. So probably for now, uh, a great example is the, the, the transit insurance in, in China, right? So when you buy, buy something online, you, you have uh, transit insurance to cover your return shipping fee. And that model is powered by AI, by machine learning. But because that's, that model, I mean, that, that, that model, I mean, that product only charge probably 10 cents and pay $10. So you can argue in the same way as a grab that uh, this is a low severity model, so you can keep the human off the loop. So, but maybe in the future, we'll have AI models on um, bigger and bigger products. So then the actuaries need to understand the model better. Yeah. Yeah, and also I heard something quite interesting uh, in another conference from some foreign, from, from some other countries where insurers are not allowed to charge different rates for by gender, right? Yes, and yeah. definitely we all know that like male has a higher incident rates in, in many things. So, one company did something quite tricky. They, 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 they brand the whole company as a pink color and build everything very lovely from their website to their product brochures to their, to their customer service and so on. So then uh, they try to make sure that the males are less likely to buy their products. And this is accepted by law. So I would say, uh, although there are some requirements, so uh, I would say not only actuaries, but the industry may come up with some interesting solutions to these yeah. regulations. Yeah, yeah, there was uh, another uh, remark from uh, Patricia about uh, uh, the, the discrimination by, by genders. Yes, she, uh, she mentioned that uh, many other industries charge uh, male, female differently. Uh, so it's not just in insurance. Uh, for example, she, she uh, mentioned the, the hair, hair salon also charge male and female differently, <laughs> which is a a good example as well. Yeah, it's a good example. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, Jack. Uh, I think uh, I think I will I will thank you very much for this uh, great presentation. And okay. uh, and I think we can uh, move to the to the next uh, the, the last speaker, uh, Jean-Michel uh, Lubes. 
Yes. yes. Yeah, so Jean-Michel, uh, let me introduce uh, the, the, the last speaker. So Jean-Michel Lubes is a professor of mathematics at the University of uh, Toulouse uh, in south of France. He's a chairman of uh, robust and uh, fair machine learning at uh, Artificial and Intelligence Institute of Toulouse, which is one of the four French research centers of AI. His uh, research is uh, focused on building new machine learning methods to obtain explainable, fair, and robust algorithms for controlling their, their risk. Authors of more than 50 research papers in uh, statistics, probability, and uh, AI. He has also uh, directed more than 50 PhD students and uh, he is member of the CNRS, uh, which is the Research Council of National Center for Scientific uh, Research. And he has been uh, elected in uh, 2020 as VP of uh, Toulouse University, responsible for innovation uh, for, for industry. So uh, Jean-Michel will uh, perform a presentation on bias and fairness in machine learning. Indeed, he will explain how machine learning can go wrong because of many factors in the data set and how to reduce these uh, biases when one performs machine learning model. And he will uh, demonstrate his uh, point of view by giving some, example, uh, some examples with uh, samples with bias. So um, I will let you to start your presentation, uh, Jean-Michel. Thank you very much, uh, Riada. Uh, first of all, I'm very happy to, to participate to this uh, webinar. And uh, I'm going to try to give you some insight about uh, what was already discussed by the two uh, other uh, speakers of today, that uh, artificial intelligence and especially machine learning algorithm are wonderful tools, but that can be uh, sometimes harmful due to the, the discrimination and the bias that may uh, incorporate into decisions. So just to, to start, uh, no one can deny that uh, artificial intelligence and machine uh, learning uh, models have provided great achievements over several years. So maybe I start with two uh, very striking examples when uh, Watson, uh, has won Geopard Games and more recently when uh, AlphaGo uh, defeated a master at Go. And uh, due to all the improvement in machine learning, uh, due to uh, mainly uh, new algorithms, which is uh, called a deep learning, deep learning techniques, then we are just expecting uh, algorithm to help us in our daily uh, life in order to be better uh, than humans uh, when taking decisions. But uh, if you look at some, uh, some examples, for instance, I just focus on one example, which is using a machine learning algorithm to, uh, for hiring process in companies. So um, there were, there were uh, in the last few years, some examples of big companies and not, uh, uh, small companies, but uh, Amazon and uh, Palantir, which are very uh, companies specialists of artificial intelligence, where they try to use uh, algorithm to help them in the hiring process. Then what happens? That uh, what happens that something went wrong in the sense that Amazon developed uh, some kind of machist. Uh, algorithm that was discriminating, discriminating against women and Palantir had some algorithm we were uh, discriminating against Asian applicants. So despite all the wonderful people working in this company and the specialist of uh, artificial intelligence al algorithm, they were, uh, despite of all the effort, they were building uh, algorithm that were uh, propagating some kind of bias and in so much that uh, there were uh, actually trials and the lost trials. So how can this is possible? Uh, first, I just want to recall some uh, basis of machine learning to help you understand why 
uh, bias can be propagated using uh, algorithms. So first, uh, I just come back to the, maybe the roots of uh, artificial intelligence, which was called some years ago, big data. And the big data paradigm was that when you want to build a new model, you need data. And in fact, you will analyze this data and try to fit a model to this data. So the machine learning and artificial algorithm works if you have at hand a set of labeled examples that it's called supervised learning and then you try to optimize in a better way in a more sophisticated way something in this end the rule you obtain fill the data so, so the more the data, the more accurate description of the reality. But once you have looked at the data, you have your rule. And what has done the, the artificial intelligence, just, just learned a rule to fit the data. And then when you have the observation, you will apply this rule as if the data were similar to the data you have observed. So, in, I will not bother you too much with uh, maths, but let's uh, give some notations. You have uh, basically a target variable y that you want to predict using some characteristic variable which is called x. And what, in fact, what do you learn when you do uh, machine learning? You just learn from the past observation the relationship between y and x based on the observation. Don't to do that, you just minimize in the best possible way a cost function to measure how acceptable is it to predict something which is called y hat and you want y hat to be closed to uh, your y. So in doing that, you can train a model in the sense that the, 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 the algorithm will provide prediction that will be similar to the true levels from the observation set. And you trust uh, artificial intelligence algorithm because you can provide some mathematical guarantees that the algorithm will not make too much errors. So what does, what does that mean? It means that if the data you test your algorithm on is similar to the data you observed, similar in which way, in the sense that it has what we call in statistics the same distribution, then you can ensure that your algorithm will behave in the best possible way that will, it will not make too much mi uh, mistake. So from a theoretical point of view in philosophy you have just look at some property you have learned a property from observation and then you have transformed it into a global rule so in fact the algorithm is not going to imagine the best rule because he has understood what was in, uh, what was go uh, going on in the data set he has only construed a rule based on the observation. So artificial intelligence algorithm is not magic. Artificial intelligence is just a way to extract information from the database and then to transform it into a model, a rule and propagate. So you understand easily that everything is highly dependent on the observation distribution you put inside. And if the learning sample is biased because uh, the data set has some trains, then you will maybe not learn a rule, but you will only learn this bias. And maybe it's not, uh, you do not reflect the, the, the desired world. And uh, maybe it reflects the desired world, but it does not reflect the behavior you are imagining for the model because sometimes the world is biased and you wanted the machine to be 
more clever than, than the bias and to uh, predict something more robust, something which is a rule, but no, maybe the algorithm will just predict some uh, correlation. So uh, it's, uh, that's the key point of uh, acceptability of artificial intelligence, because in fact, uh, if, uh, what is your goal when you do uh, artificial intelligence? You, you want to automate a decision process. So if there are correlation and bias in the data set that enable to forecast, it's good. But are you sure that this is a real understanding of the, of, uh, of the reality you want? Do you really want to, 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 to just use the fact maybe that pink color uh, attracts only women or do you want to base your decision on, on something which is maybe more relevant? So that, 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 that's the, the typical question you have to ask before using artificial intelligence because once you have built your model, the algorithm which generalizes the situation to the world population. So it will, in a way, shapes the world reality according to the rule without any question, no evolution. And uh, now that uh, many complex algorithms are used to deep learning models, then it's, it plays uh, the role as black box model. And it's very difficult to understand what kind of decision was, was taken. So if you have an algorithm that reproduces a bias and generates to the world population without any uh, possibility to understand or to explain, then it's very difficult to, to, to base a uh, decision. And maybe the decision, maybe it's unfair, maybe law does not, pro does not uh, allow you to do that, and maybe if the situation, the situation change, you will be wrong and you will not understand why you, you will, will be wrong. So uh, over the last uh, few years, there were a lot of new research to deal with this problem of bias and about fairness in machine learning. So I'm going to... Aha. Hear that? Yes. Ah, okay. Uh, yes, you have some issue. No, no. Uh, I had lost. I thought I had lost the connection, but no. Uh, okay. No, no, it's okay. We can hear you. Okay, perfect. So uh, it's very difficult to give a, a proper mathematical uh, definition of what is fair, because uh, as uh, previous speakers said, fairness is complicated and depends on uh, different uh, notion, moral questioning, uh, law questioning or uh, industrial questioning. So uh, in, in machine learning theory, we try to characterize fairness by considering a variable, which is called S, it, which is called the sensitive attributes. And we will say that something is fair if the decision does not depend on that variable. So you have to decide that a variable should not play uh, an important role in the dec dec decision ma making process. So when I say you sh you, this variable should not, not play, maybe the state holder decides, but maybe sometimes the moral decides or maybe the law. So for instance, if S is a variable which is the gender, then in some case you can use the gender to forecast, in some case you cannot use. S could be the ethnic origin or can be anything. So it's, it can be anything that in fact divides the, uh, the individuals into subgroups and this choice is driven by legal, ethical, technical concerns. So if an algorithm is fair, it means that this variable S should not play a key role in the decision process. So to, I'm going to give you uh, an example uh, to show you how uh, an algorithm, a machine learning algorithm, can go completely wrong uh, when uh, trying to decide a binary variable. So in my example, we're going to try to predict, a bank is going to, to predict if it can give a, a loan 
to a new cust customer. So uh, why is the decision? So if y is equal to one, that means that the customer is going to pay for his credit and y is equal to zero when it fails to pay the credit. And uh, there is a protected attribute. So S will be either the ethnic origin, which is Caucasian and non-Caucasian, or will be the gender, male and female. And we want to see if the algorithm favor one group over the other. So to do that, uh, I'm going to uh, use some um, definition, which is uh, a very old definition. It's called the disparate impact. And we say that an algorithm G has a disparate impact when the outcome of the algorithm is not the same for one class to another. So you look at the proportion of the good decision. So that's the proportion, this one, of the uh, people, number of people who have been granted a loan for the class S equal, equal to zero, and you divide by the proportion of the people who have been granted a loan for the other, pro um, other group. So if the algorithm is completely fair, the algorithm should not depend on S, so this should be equal to zero, two to one, sorry. So if S does not play a role in the attribution of a loan, then S, the disparate impact should be equal to one. If this score is very low, it means that in proportion, the population S equal to one is very much favored by the algorithm. So this, uh, this disparate impact is, uh, in fact, in the uh, US law and lots of trials can be done if you can compute this criterion and prove that this criterion is too small. So in, in the law, they say that this should be greater than 0 0.1. So from the uh, US uh, law, an algorithm is unfair if this proportion is smaller than 0 0.8. To my point of view, this is uh, arbitrary. So you could look at uh, the proportion of, uh, in the data set, the initial proportion of unfairness. To do that, you will not look at the proportion of the decision of the algorithm, but the real proportion. So you look at in the data set you have, the number of people who have succeeded in paying back their credit for the minority, and you divide it by the same quantity by the majority. And this gives you an insight of the actual bias in the data set. And uh, you can say that an algorithm is fair if the bias it induces is at the same level at the bias already present in the, in the data set. So you should, uh, to my point of view, but it's not, it's not the legal point of view, uh, a classifier should not increase the bias already present. So once I have this uh, definition, I'm going to show you uh, an example. So uh, the example is the following. You want to predict uh, the risk of uh, credit and you have at your disposal 14 variables, which are the age, uh, the education number, marital uh, status, lots of, uh, lots of uh, other variables. And by the way, this is a very uh, famous uh, public uh, data set, which is called adult data set, which, was, which has been used for uh, Kegel uh, challenge many years ago. And uh, among all the variables, you have two variables, which is one, the ethnic origin, and one, the sex. So the first question, when you want to build your model based on the data, you ask yourself if there is a bias already present in the data set. So if I look at, uh, the, at the data set, 
you can see that uh, one of uh, the main reason you grant a loan is based, is based on what is called the solvability of uh, the individual. And you see that the, 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 the risk is low when within the five next year, you predict that someone will have a wage, a salary greater than 50 kilo dollars a year. And if you look at the proportion of female in the data set with uh, low and high salary, you see that there is, the data set is not balanced because you have more male with a large salary than female. So this is the first warning uh, you have to, to, to understand that the, you're going to train uh, your uh, algorithm on the data set which is unbalanced. And you see you have the same unbalanced between uh, Caucasian because, because Caucasian with in this data set, uh, there are more uh, Caucasian people with high uh, income. So you, when you're going to train your algorithm on data sets, you may face unbiased decision, but not, not always. So if first I look at uh, the question whether I induce some bias if with respect to the ethnic origin. So I will use uh, three uh, machine learning algorithms. The first one is a very, very simple, uh, it's just a regression. So it's not a black, black, black box at all. It's a very explainable algorithm. The other ones, another very simple decision tree. And another one is extreme gradient boosting, which is a more complicated, more accurate, but a black box, black box, black box model. So if I train uh, the algorithm here, this is the reference. So this is the level of bias present in the data set. So you can see that in the data set, there is a bias in the sense that if the bias is computed with respect to the ethnic origin, you have 40% more chance for uh, Caucasian people to be granted a loan. But when you see in uh, for the three other algorithms, you have more or less the same level of bias. So even if in this case, the data set was unbalanced, when you use your algorithm, you have not an uh, algorithm that worsen the, the bias. But if I change the variable ethnic origin and I replace by the gender, here you can see that the, this is a situation in the world and this is the situation for the three algorithms. Though the three algorithms have worsened the situation and in this fact, the algorithm has transformed a correlation, a spurious correlation, that means that uh, female in the data set had a lowest income than male. And you can see that the algorithm has look at this correlation and transform it into a decision rule. So that means that your algorithm is discriminated against women. And even something which is a very uh, linear model is the one that discriminates most. So is there a problem? Yes, there is a problem with this because you have uh, regula reg regulation. So in 2018, in the European, we have the GDPR, which uh, claims that automatic decision taken by algorithm should be unbiased with respect to some variables. And for instance, we, that you should not discriminate with respect to gender. Uh, that's special uh, in Europe, but uh, you, if you look at the trials in the USA and the Canada, you, you, you see that there are more and more uh, trials uh, and people that can sue you if you use uh, automatic decision that uh, depend on uh, gender. That's what say the law, but uh, what is difficult is that the law does not explain you 
how to uh, solve this issue. They, they, they give you some recommendation. They say, okay, no, do, you should not use the variable in the data set. So let's try and just remove the variable from the data set. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to train again my model, not using the variable. And you can see that I have exactly, exactly the same level of discrimination, whether I use the variables uh, to train uh, my models or if I do not use my, my variable. And I have exactly also the same uh, efficiency. Why? Because in fact, uh, I do not need to tell the algorithm who is a male with a female because male and female is just a proxy for all the other characteristics and the um, gender is correlated with all the variables and the algorithm can imagine himself who is a male, who is a female and reconstruct completely this variable S. So the recommendation of the law does not work here. So I, I've got a very uh, deep problem because, in fact, my algorithm discriminates. Now, I, what says the law? The law said that a proof of discrimination can be obtained by uh, creating uh, what is called contrafactual model. What is it? It's just when you, you have a uh, uh, anonymous uh, curriculum of or anonymous applicant where you remove the, uh, the the effect of the gender by sending two forms one is female one is male with exactly the same characteristic and that's a legal proof of discrimination but what I, what I can do I can change my algorithm and I'm going here to change my algorithm and to force my algorithm to, when he receives two uh, forms, is going to try the, uh, to, produce, to, to forecast the best uh, solution, whether if it's a male or a female. So I just change uh, my algorithm by checking the two genders and giving as final outcome, the best possible solution. So my algorithm in this is completely uh, fair with respect to this kind of proof of discrimination. If you look yet at my disparate impact, you can see that my algorithm is still biased. How can this be possible? It's possible uh, if you know statistics, you did not have to look at these experiments and the previous experiments where I show you that I can remove the S variable and that it was changing the solution, you, sh you, you could have stopped with that. But this uh, experiment is just to prove you that I can build uh, an algorithm that uh, is completely hidden with respect to uh, the proof, uh, the, this type, type of proof of discrimination, but still is very biased. Why is it possible? It's because it's in fact because when you look at uh, uh, algorithm, you, you look at maybe all possible correlation, and uh, even if you try to pretend that your individual is a male, the algorithm will automatically recognize that it has uh, the characteristic of if, of a female, and the output will be the one it could have uh, given following this trend. So it's, it's a very complicated, and in this case, justice is completely blinded with respect to all the machine learning algorithms. So it's, it's very complicated because on, on the one side, you uh, want to uh, not to discriminate to comply the, the law, but the law itself gives you little recommendation. But uh, beware, if someone is able to show you the evidence that, in fact, you have made discrimination, then you can be sued. You can be pushed into trial and you will lose it uh, because uh, the law is very clear that no discrimination should be done. And uh, I have given you this example, but there is lots of uh, 
other uh, example, for instance, uh, there was a huge trial uh, that showed that uh, a company were trying to, to predict uh, recidivism in, in jails and it was uh, discriminating against Afro-Americans and they, they lost the trial. Uh, here I'm giving you some uh, social examples but there is also some very famous example when you want to predict uh, wolf versus uh, huskies. And uh, you can see that in fact, if you want to forecast uh, dogs versus wolf, then if you have a variable which is the background and if the variable is you have a snow background, then all Huskies will be turned into wolf. So in fact, your algorithm as here is making in a sense some discrimination of Huskies against wolf. Uh, if the Husky uh, is a picture of the Huskies is given uh, is in snow. So uh, it's, uh, it's complicated because in fact, uh, if you change your habit and if you have uh, more uh, pictures of Huskies in, in, in snowy environments, then the algorithm will fail because the algorithm has learned that something which looks like a husky with a snow background should be a wolf. So all these questions have uh, arise in the machine learning uh, community. And nowadays there are a thriving uh, trend of research in what is called fairness, fairness and robustness in order to correct all these algorithms. So I show you some very uh, basic uh, uh, notion to how to correct. So this is a, a research paper we have made where we have proved that we can uh, correct an algorithm. So this is a deep neural uh, architecture and then we can correct it by adding uh, a kind of a special design penalty at the last uh, hidden layer to enforce uh, some uh, the, the decision not to take into account some uh, this, this, this variable. So my um, message is the following and I, this is a, the, some work I've, uh, I have done uh, on the adult data set. You can achieve basically the same level of prediction accuracy using different penalty, different algorithm. And you can choose to discriminate. You can choose to reach the same level of bias uh, between uh, male and female that is already present in the data set. Or you can have uh, affirmative action and, take, uh, and try to correct the world by uh, having the to, to, by enforcing the algorithm not to discriminate uh, against, uh, against, um, uh, against male and female. So this is all technical works, uh, work, research work by uh, data scientists. And it's very complicated to control and certify because if you know nothing about uh, machine learning techniques and a data scientist uh, on its own can choose just to, to discriminate more than the world, to make the world better or to correct the, the, the world. And if the algorithm is a completely black box model, then no one will ever know. So my message is that you need to be aware of this situation and you need to uh, understand the regulation and you, you need also to work on the explainability of your, of your, of your artificial intelligence uh, algorithm in order to be prepared to face these important issues. So I'm going to, to conclude uh, quickly. So uh, the, the main issue is uh, how to certify uh, uh, that uh, your algorithm will not uh, be uh, discriminating against people. So how to control the, the risk of discrimination. So 
first, the f you have to be aware that even if you don't want to discriminate, if your data set, your learning set is biased, then your algorithm will automatically have some bias. And unless you dig into uh, uh, machine learning techniques and new techniques to uh, correct this. But this may come at a price because you will not be able to use your traditional uh, uh, machine learning algorithm and you will re really have to, to ask you uh, the good question. So there, uh, my last message is uh, to be, uh, to, to ask yourself, what is my goal? Do I want to uh, have affirmative action? Do I want to maximize uh, some key time? Do I want to protect myself against some uh, regulation. So it's very complicated and uh, it's at this moment and it's close to the research field, but lots of people are working on that. But the, the, the main uh, conclusion is to be aware of this kind of issue. I will just stop here and ask and answer some questions. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jean-Michel. Many thanks for this uh, great presentation. So, yeah, we understand that uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning can lead to many issues like uh, discrimination and uh, uh, because machine learning will replicate the unbalanced data in the society, right? Huh? And, and we exactly. see that, uh, that several steps need to be taken before arriving at an unbiased sample that will make the AI more accurate and, and more fair. Um, yes, thank you. Thank you for this, uh, this clarification. We have uh, one question uh, from Saria uh, uh, in, the, in the Zoom group chat. So uh, I read it. Um, even if, we, if you remove sensitive factors like ethnicity or sex, sometimes there are proxies variables that are likely make models still discriminate. For example, postal codes and income levels can be proxies that can uh, discriminate. So how do we deal with this kind of situations when proxy variables make models biased? Yes, it's, it's, it's exactly the, the topic of my, um, of, of my talk. In fact, uh, uh, in fact, it's, it's very, it's very uh, difficult to remove the effect of these variables uh, because uh, you, they, they, are, they are very highly correlated to, to all other variables and machine learning uh, algorithms look at uh, this uh, correlation. So in, in fact, you have three ways to correct. The first way is try to first pre-process your data in order to try to build what is called fair representation, fair characteristic of your variables. So if you transform all your, vi all your variables to try to remove a priori the effects of the, uh, these variables. But then you change the variables, so this could be tricky. Then the second way, that the one uh, I chose to, to show here, is in the learning process, you try to enforce independence of the decision. Uh, and this, and for this, you add some penalties. So here is an example um, um, of penalty I've chosen. And the third way is to let your learning step do as usual, and then to post-process all the decision rules in order to warrant this independence with respect to this. So, in fact, there are uh, lots of. Um, uh, new algorithms that are developed in the, at the moment. You have uh, on the website of uh, IBA uh, a solution uh, to try uh, to remove this, uh, this effect. You have uh, the famous uh, toolbox by Google, which is called What If, where you can try to test this kind of uh, uh, thing. And here I give you some uh, GitHub where you can try to find some algorithm. But there is the, uh, it's complicated to find some uh, off-the-shelf solution because uh, the correlation helps you to forecast. So if you remove too much correlation, then 
you will lose too much information uh, in your data set and you will change the uh, efficiency of your algorithm. So it's, it's, it's complicated and there is really a trade-off between fairness and accuracy. And then you, you have the, the, the stakeholders have to, to be aware of this risk and to be able to, to, to choose this balance between uh, the, the usual way the algorithm behaves and the fairness uh, you want to achieve. Okay, Jean-Michel, thank you for your answer. So, so what do you think? Do you think that um, this kind of uh, methods can be used in the market? Uh, what, are, what are the best practices in the market from, from your perspective? Is it uh, still at the theoretical steps or is it used in the, in the market for in the, in the industry? It's, it's used more and more uh, because the number of trials uh, for uh, discrimination due to the use of artificial intelligence algorithm is increasing. Uh, and that's, that's the, main, uh, the main issue. When, uh, when you are uh, now the regulation asks uh, artificial intelligence to be in a sense more fair than human uh, decision. Uh, human decision uh, have to be fair, but uh, automatic dis fairness in automatic decision is, uh, uh, is really uh, looked uh, at very deeply by, uh, by courts. So uh, the best practice is try to find some uh, relevant uh, quantities and try to assess uh, with respect to these uh, quantities, uh, what is your uh, algorithm really doing? So if you, if you can explain the reason why the decision was taken, then you face less trials for discrimination. So for, for me, the key issue is explainability. If you, if you use an algorithm which is a completely black box and then someone comes with uh, a quantitative argument saying that you have, uh, uh, you have used an algorithm which leads to discrimination, then you face big troubles. If you understand what your algorithm is really doing and if you can explain it, then you can maybe convince that it looks like discrimination, but in fact it's not because uh, it's only proxies or it's only uh, a natural choice. Uh, for instance, in some countries, uh, you can use gender in uh, insurance policies. Uh, in some countries, you cannot, but you, you have to be sure what is uh, uh, really doing your, your, your algorithm. So you have to, you have to be, uh, 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 you have to be able to understand your algorithm and to certify. So for me, certification of AE against explainability is, are the real key issues. Okay. Okay, thank you very much for your, for your answer. It's, uh, it's quite clear uh, that we have to be careful with this uh, question on biases and, uh, and uh, fairness in, uh, in artificial intelligence. So I, I'm checking yeah, if- uh, 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 Riada, yeah. I just want to add yes. on to, to what uh, Jean-Michel was, was sharing. Yes, yes, yeah, go ahead. Uh, I mean, certainly the fairness is something that's certainly very important, right? I think mean, if you look at the, uh, uh, the industry, I mean, uh, I mean like, when they think about contact, right? I mean, you probably heard about a project called Veritas, which is driven by, by MAS, right? the, uh, the regulator in Singapore. I think they also, they also noticed the, uh, the issue of fairness in, in, the, in, the, in the industry, right? in the practice of uh, AI machine learning in, in the industry. So I think they are pushing for a project called Veritas. And then they are trying to evaluate the, uh, uh, the four principles of, of, of application of AI, right? And then the fairness, in fact, the first one. I think they have four principles. The first one is the fairness. The second one is uh, uh, ethics. And then the third one is the account, uh, accountability, right? And then the last one, T, T is probably stand for transparency or something, I forgot. But basically, I think, mean, yeah, fairness certainly is a very important uh, 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 issues, right? Uh, certainly, is a very important one. And then, maybe just on the, if I may add one more point, right? Uh, fairness is certainly important. And another thing is also on the uh, robustness of the model, right? Because sometimes, uh, especially for deep learning models, 
I think we probably heard about uh, some kind of a, a, a adversarial attack to the deep learning models, right? So you can, like let's say the original photo is a panda. I mean, someone adds some kind of a noise to that, the panda will, be, will become a gibbon. I mean, it'd be recognized by the machine, right? Then there's also another aspect uh, we certainly need to need to look into as well, right? Which is the, uh, the robustness of, of the, uh, the model as well. Yeah. Yes, ex uh, exactly. I, I was just, just looking at uh, at this picture. If you 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 have an algorithm which is trained, and the algorithm has found some uh, variables, uh, which is in fact a co-founding uh, variable, and takes all the decision uh, that, uh, then you might you might run into big trouble if you change your your condition. Uh, for instance, if you have uh, uh, if you if you train your algorithm to a differentiate Husky versus Wolf uh, in uh, some uh, countries where there are a uh, few uh, dogs in a snow environment, then your algorithm will be uh, will be right. But then if you take the same uh, algorithm and you use it uh, in Siberia or in Alaska where uh, snow is everywhere, then your algorithm will be wrong. So uh, you, have, uh, you can build uh, artificial attacks by understanding uh, uh, that there is some bias in the data set and then enforcing, uh, using and enforcing this bias and then you change everything. And at the end, you have an algorithm which is not robust anymore to the change of uh, environments. And for instance, it was, uh, uh, it was uh, uh, the, the key for uh, uh, a company using, uh, building airplanes. And uh, she was, this company had uh, an algorithm which was trained to, uh, for uh, automatic landing. And one of the variables was uh, rain. And the algorithm, if there were lots of rain, was completely wrong because, in fact, the algorithm was not. Uh, uh, people thought that the the artificial intelligence algorithm was, in fact, uh, building uh, a physical uh, uh, law uh, driven by physics, and in fact, it was just looking at correlation correlation with rain, and and in fact. Uh, this is, was uh, a bias with uh, lots of uh, industrial uh, uh, um, Im importance. So, so bias is very relevant when you want to look at robustness. Right, okay. Right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, you, uh, JS, you want to add something? Uh, no, no, no. No, okay. Yeah. Yes, yeah, thank just you. Just to echo, echo what uh, Jean-Michel was saying, yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Jean-Michel, and uh, thank you, JS, uh, for the additional uh, uh, explanation of, uh, of, of, of this, uh, the, the fairness in, uh, in AI. Um, I'm looking if we have uh, more questions. So you still have time to ask uh, one or two questions, no more. So, well, I think we, uh, we, we have to conclude because we, uh, we are already over the, the two hours. So um, uh, thank you. Thank you very much for, for the, these three presentations. Uh, this uh, webinar will never have taken place in this way without your participation. So uh, thank you, uh, JS, uh, Jack, and uh, Jean-Michel for, for your time and uh, for performing this uh, interesting topics and uh, challenging in uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, I do believe that uh, we understand more uh, the topics about, about uh, the uh, artificial intelligence modeling ethics and uh, risk governance in the insurance industry. So, and then thank you to all the people who participate in, uh, in the setting up of this uh, webinar, uh, uh, Yong and uh, Patsy. And I would like to thank you, uh, Paul, for uh, encouraging us uh, to do this topic on artificial intelligence and, and thank you very much for, for your support uh, for this, uh, this, this webinar. So I would like to tell you if, uh, if you want to, uh, to visit uh, the, the SAS website and do not hesitate to visit it to find out uh, about the next webinars uh, that will take place on uh, very exciting topics. Uh, so the, the, you, you can do it.
Um, Paul, if you want to say some words to, to finish no, the, the webinar. Yeah, I'm just overrun already. So thank thank you all yes. again. Uh, yes, um, I, 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 I'm very happy that um, there's some good uh, questions and actually it's an area that we're going to look for uh, in the coming months and also next year as well um, to, to um, expand and to engage the actual community. So continue to keep um, emailing us and also to engage all the members here as well. And then, um, yes, uh, and um, we look forward to uh, taking this forward. Okay, so um, if there's no further questions, okay, um, yes, I think we can call it a day for the session. Have a good weekend, everyone. And um, I'll see you at the next uh, climate change and cyber sessions in the coming weeks. Okay. Yes. And, and then maybe you. if I... Yeah, yeah, if I may just add on, right? I mean, like, if you feel anything that which uh, yeah, Singapore can help you, uh, feel free to reach out to us because our mandate is really to help uh, Singapore companies to really adopt our AI, right? So if you feel anything, you can just uh, feel free to reach out to me. Just now, I, I leave a QR code on, 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 on the slides. I'm not sure whether you notice that, but you can scan the QR code and then reach out to us. Okay. Cool. Thank okay. you. Yeah. We'll definitely be in touch. Nice, nice weekend. Weekend. Okay, thanks. Bye. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, thanks, thanks everyone. So the, bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye.